Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm very excited to talk with you about how to be a rebel, a rebel with a course. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we can also have a good conversation, discussions afterwards. So um, when we talk about change, a lot of times something happens that we are starting out with, with very big ambitions. We have large goals, big goals when we want to change something, either when we want to change something on an enterprise level, on a team level, within a product, or even in our families or our own lives. That is the ambition, but when we are looking at the reality, most often this is what, what actually happens. Um, there is not so much achievement when we look at um, what, what did we actually achieve afterwards, it's, it's not so much. And um, that is, for example, when we are starting out, when we try to um, to change our own behaviors or when we try to help others within an organization to change things. So I was curious about that fact. So how can we, how can we change maybe our approach to change? Or how can we get inspired from other people who are professionally into change, but not from the same perspective as we are? As I'm, for example, as a designer looking at change. How are, what are different perspectives on change? So why is it so damn hard, right? That is, that is a question. Uh, because when you look at it, first of all, it should be a rather simple story. You, we all hear from, from everywhere, from each, each issue of the Harvard Business Magazine, for example, CEO is telling, telling us all over again, we need to change. We need, we need this kind of change. And when I interact with clients, they also tell me all the time, okay, change is needed. Uh, we need more, being more innovative. We need to be more customer driven. We need new ideas, things like that. So that is one part of the equation. And the other part is um, we are there to help, either as a consultant coming from the outside or already being in the company and we want to change something. We want to change something for our team for our organization as a whole, and so on. And uh, so it should be a rather easy equation, but of course, uh, a lot of time change is not happening. And that is a very interesting dilemma, of course, right? Um, and I'm also, of course, not the first one trying to tackle that, but um, it got me thinking, it got me thinking about different ways how to approach it. So the question for me was, how can we get from the aspiration to change something into actually making change happen. So I was looking around, and here are some usual suspects for making change happen. Activists um, who are um, like, like Greenpeace, who are changing, trying to change the world or parts of the world to make it into a better place. We have politicians who should do that for for citizens, right? They are elected to do that. But we also have maybe the darker side of politics. We have lobbyists, uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes driven by money, uh, who are have, having the ears and sometimes uh, the eyes or the, the pockets of politicians and, and try to influence the system in that way, uh, bringing change in that way. Okay, And uh, another change makers are coaches who are more concerned about how can we help the individual or smaller teams grow and unfold their potential, change in the right direction. But then there are one, one kind of guys standing out for me. These are uh, rebels. And I got curious about the rebels because rebels, they, what makes them interesting is they are using unorthodox way how to bring change into the world. That's one thing. The other thing is that uh, they are looking for change on a, lar on a rather large scale. So it's not only about a product, not only about a service. It's really about making big change happening within a society, for example. And what's also very interesting is um, when we look at the history of rebellions, um, a lot of what there was people tried to do failed. And not all the rebellions or rebels uh, were really keeping to a, to a, uh, onto a p uh, path of, of goodness, right? You can, can very easily fall from your, from your path, you can trip off, and, uh, and then something happens that was not intended in the first place. So that is also a um, very interesting, the controversial concept, and that's why I like it, and I was uh, digging deeper into that. 
Okay, we are talking about good rebels here. So I'm not talking about rebels who use violence um, as, a, as a mean to, to achieve something. I'm really talking about uh, rebels who, who try to uh, use their, their influence and their motivation to bring something good into the world uh, with, with using also tools that, uh, that, that are helpful and that are um, peaceful in a way. So that, that is also an important distinction to make, of course. So this is just a, a bunch of rebels. Some of you you might recognize. Some of you maybe seen this kind of pictures for the first time. Some of you might not think that these are rebels or rebels because uh, they come by different main uh, uh, names and definitely coming from different ways of life. Right? We have rebels from religion, from business, politics, and so on. And I just want to use these ex as examples, as kind of role models, to get an idea how change can actually happen from a rebellious perspective. So, um, just a, a very, very simple framework to bring all these things together. Um, we have the rebel himself or herself, and the, the change that is happening is also happening, of course, with the person herself. So uh, there's kind of a circle, and I will talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit more later. Um, around that, we need to have a coalition. We need to have a team. We, have to, we need to have allies who are helping us to achieve something. Because let's face it, most of the change that is really impactful or that is really helpful, uh, you cannot do it on your own. You need, you need to have uh, compatriots. You need to have somebody who is helping you to actually achieve something. And then in the outer circle, of course, we have the system. We have the thing that we want to change. It can be our team. It can be our unit within the organization. But of course, it can also be part of society or society uh, in a, as a whole. And around that, or kind of intertwined in that, I see six aspects uh, that can help us to achieve ch uh, change. Um, and I want to guide you through all of those six rather quickly because I, I only have limited time for that. Um, and we will do that guided by the six rebels that you just saw. Okay? So let's start with, with Mahatma Gandhi. Um, one thing about, you, you all know um, uh, most probably a lot of stories about uh, Mahatma Gandhi, but one thing is that when he finished his work in South Africa, he was going back to his home home country of, of India. And he was doing that with, together with his wife, Kastruba, in 1915. And what Gandhi did, and what is interesting here, is um, he decided to not um, use the normal way that would be appropriate to his, to his um, standard profession as a, as a lawyer to do that. He decided to go there and use a, a third-class carriage drive all through chi uh, China, <laughs> all through India. No. Not, not, even not going to China, but, but uh, to India, um, together with his wife. So we can imagine what it means in, in 1915 to ride on such a carriage uh, and such a wagon. It means uh, unbearable heat during the day and, and, and freezing cold at night. But he's, he was doing that. And I think what we can learn from, from that is that um, is something that, that Gandhi later said was, um, at that situation, he said, I really realized how much our country, how much are my, my fellow men and women are suffering. Uh, I really felt it. I really immersed in the situation. So seeing what is there is one of the aspects I want to talk about. So really be, be in the situation. That is something I, I think we can, we can learn from, from Gandhi here. Um, I will want to connect it with my own story, my own experience. Of course, uh, these are in comparison to what all these rebels did are rather small things, but uh, to get a little bit on the business perspective, my personal perspective in. I was working for a company um, and was hired to lead an innovation initiative within this company. They had a problem that they were very tech focused, very much about very engineer driven, and they they hit the wall and they, they couldn't get further with that. Not not from revenue perspective, but also not from an internal growth perspective. So um, I was lucky to, to be hired to get in there, build up a team of enthusiasts, of inspired people to bring 
change to the company, make the company more customer focused, make it more innovative. That was my task. So I, I gathered the people who had interest in the company. I also uh, was able to hire new people and bring into the company to have a small tribe, you could call it, um, to work on, on those things. And um, what I was thinking is that I'm doing everything right because I've, I've read a lot about innovation. I've, I, I thought I was in a very good um, condition to face that challenge. I've done uh, innovation and change work before, so uh, it looked all very good. And also the work with the team felt very good. So people got inspired. We, we did internal interviews. We are uh, not only with the, with the employees themselves, but also with the broader network. Uh, we, we made workshops. We tried to inspire people to, to hand over the torch of innovation, all those things that you read about and that you know this is the right thing, right? That, that is the right thing to do. But um, after a while, some, some months into the project, we realized that in this inner circle of innovation drivers, the, the motivation was, was going down, it was deteriorating. And um, what we realized was that a lot of that came from the fact that whenever we had conversation with people in the, in the company, they got inspired. They say, okay, this is definitely what we need to do. This is what I want and I will, I will do it right away when I left this conversation. I will do it in my division and, and so on. But we realized that nothing was happening actually. There was no, 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 no person who really took the torch of, of innovation and was doing that in their, in their own division. And we asked, um, at that point, we, we, we ignored it. And uh, so in a way, we all had good intentions to do something. Um, then we, we um, had this slow death of, of motivation within our team. And the question is, how could we not have noticed that? Why, why, why did it only occur to us months later that something, something was missing? And what was missing was uh, a curious thing that uh, we only found out in hindsight or asking people is that before us, before we started this innovation campaign, there were actually two other innovation campaigns before that in the company several years ago. And um, it was a fact that the, both of those campaigns were completely failures. Um, it was so much a failure that, that people were kind of afraid of innovation. Uh, just using the term innovation was a problem. And while the people got engaged and inspired when we were directly talking with them, there was um, a cognitive, uh, um, an organizational remembrance, an organizational, uh, yeah, we, we, we still know exactly. We still know innovation is a nightmare. Uh, I'm, I'm excited, but... Um, when I, whenever they stepped out of those situations where they interacted with us, they said, okay, no, uh, innovation, that is a no-go. Because innovation was stifled from top management before and people were fired actually when they tried to be a little bit more sick, Zach. Uh, and that, that was a problem. So, um, yeah, we were definitely not seeing what is, what is there. So now, to, to flip that, what can we do? How can we... Um, how can we be more aware of what is actually happening. One thing is that we are really uh, involving ourselves in the situation, trying to see uh, the, the situation from a systemic perspective and um, being aware of the fact that all what we see is just one perspective of it. So be th that this is very subjective, that we are all biased. And the only thing that we can do is try, try to, to broaden our horizon, to, to get away with the blinders that, that we have. And um, one technique that I use, a simple one, is what I call uh, creating a rich picture of now. Meaning, in fact, j just looking around, asking questions, and especially asking the questions that you might not ask. So really sitting down together with the other people and, and asking them, what are the questions we are inclined to not ask here? And then also asking yourself, what are the people we are inclined to not talk to? And for example, we have here Frank, the CFO of the company. I, I changed his name. And uh, yeah, we, 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 we omitted Frank. We, were, we, were, we were heard that when we were starting this innovation campaign, we were, we were uh, told that Frank is not interested. Frank can be a problem. Better avoid him. Um, we are compartmentalizing him, so he will not be a problem, but just avoid him. 
In hindsight, I found out if, because I sat together with this guy, and Frank is actually a very, very nice and open guy, uh, that he could have told me right from the beginning that there is a history of innovation in the company. It was not always very good, and uh, I could have learned from that. So um, better talk to Frank next time. And then also, as a, as a bonus, what you can do is ask yourself, why? Why am I not asking those questions? Why am I not talking with this guy? And in my situation, it was definitely about has something to do with ignorance, ignoranting that this is um, a living, breathing system with its history, and I should, should be much more humble <laughs> in that regard, and also igno uh, ignoring my own hypers. So I, I definitely thought I'm, I'm the innovation hero in this game, and I, I can bring that change that this company obviously highly needs. Okay, what else can we do? We can slow up to to um, slow down to speed up. What I mean by that is take the time to ask different kind of questions. Questions where you're asking to understand and not to reply. Where you're really taking a step back and saying, okay, what is this person telling me? And then also another very simple technique is playing back to people what they're actually saying to you. Just saying, okay, is this what you're saying? Am I understanding you right? right? So that that, that people really fail to understand and that you really have the chance to understand them correctly. And then also um, switching the, co the, the perspective. This also takes time. We can switch the perspective from looking at this thing as an, a problem, as we, we are, as designers at least, we are inclined to do that. We are problem solvers, of course, but um, maybe we can flip it. We can say, okay, this is not a problem, this is an opportunity, an opportunity to bring something good into this company. And the third thing is um, asking yourself, what is my true intention here? What I, do I really want to do here? Is it, what, it, what is my motive? Uh, and in my case, it was my, my very egoistical motive was I, I wanted to be the innovation hero in the game. And um, if I would have realized that early on, I maybe could have made some, some dif differences and um, things differently. Okay. Next aspect, uh, completely different kind of rebel, of course, business rebel, uh, Elon Musk. I think what we can learn from him is, um, because he has a very specific look at rebel uh, re rebellious behavior, it's coming from a technology. He uses a lens of technology to, to ask us to go beyond what we know, to, to really make the next step and make it a, a large one, right? Not only on Earth, but going to Mars maybe, something like that, and that can be inspiring. So um, to do that, we need to ask difficult questions, and we always need to, to question the status quo. We need to find out uh, how can we improve the current situation. And nobody, will not, not, so, so to say, no, not everybody will like it, of course, when we are questioning the status quo. There will be resistance. The system is always resistant to change, and this will happen. So better be prepared for it. How can we do that? Um, first step is knowing much more about the cultural fabric of the situation that we are in. So really understanding what is the what is the system all about? How is the, for example, the power structure within this company? And one very easy thing is, for me it's very helpful to say, okay, we have the org chart of the company. That is what everybody has. Let's put it there and then create a power map. Meaning, okay, what are the real flows of information, the real flows of independency, dependencies and, and power within the system? Marking that into this map and then making comparisons. And I've never seen a, a situation where this was not completely different. You, know, you have the org chart on one hand, but on the other hand, you have the power map, and you have this one manager in the middle. He's just middle management. But you see from all the connections going in that this is where the actual power lies into the system. Would this person go away, quit his job or something, the company would be really in trouble, Some, something like that, right? It, it really opens minds, um, such a power map, but... Um, one, uh, one, uh, one suggestion is to maybe not laying, letting it laying around, because <laughs> you, uh, at least if you do not want to do that, you can, of course, inspire very interesting conversations with that, but maybe uh, do, it, do it in a very cautious way. 
So the next step would be we need to create discomfort. We, um, we need to kind of destroy the bubble that is there, the bu bubble of, of comfortness that all organizations build around them. Uh, a system wants to be in harmony. A system wants to be stable. Uh, it does not want to be disturbed from the outside, but we need to shake up things, right? If we're not shaking things up, we are not making change happen. So um, one way we can do that is to, to point at inconvenient truths in a gentle way. Um, let me give you an example. Um, I was working with um, within a company. They wanted to bring out a new version of their main product. Yeah, it was really important for them. They put all their money on this one product. It was, uh, was extremely crucial for the yeah for the for the survival even for this company to be successful with this product. So they put their best people into this into this project, working on the product, and. Um, the problem was that when I, when I was working with these people, I realized they were completely unmotivated. They were really under stress constantly, and they they were just um, not up to the task, not in the, not in a condition to do that. And um, there was a, a, a huge gap between the management and these people should do the, the actual work. And um, we were thinking, what, what can we do? How can we change that? Because the, the top management up to that point just ignored the fact that these people were not happy with what, what they're doing. So what we did is um, we, we used our, our weekly meetings when we gave uh, status reports to the, to the top management about the, the current status of the, of the product development. We used that and in, introduced just one or two slides at the beginning of this meeting when we gave, it, they gave the status. We called it um, the um, kind of, I have to, to quote that here, to make it right. Uh, what the team thinks, yes, it was very, very, very um, low-key, I would say. Yeah, it was just, okay, what, what does the team think? And we, 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 first of all, we introduced quotes that were kind of um, just giving them a, a feeling of what is the situation, but in a, in a, very, in a very gentle way first. But in, uh, starting at the third or fourth week, we introduced real, real harsh reality quotes from the team. And let, let me just quote two of that that we, that we had. Um, so an example was, our run towards the bottom regarding costs leaves no room for creating a better solution. That was one of the things. Or another person said, the lack of trust from management makes me think about quitting. And I think that was the one that when, when the top management hanging on their, on their mobiles really looked up, okay? Because these people cared about the success of the product, of course, and when their top architect tells them, I want to quit because it's I just ignored here, um, they better listen, okay? And they listened, and it helped really to, to improve the situation for the team and also improve the relationship between the management and this team. Okay, a third aspect, how to question the status quo is to break unwritten rules, to bring in uh, what Rick Lewis, an entertainer, calls intelligent misbehavior. So be intelligently misbehaving um, so that you're, you're not get kicked out immediately because that is, of course, a risk, right? You, uh, if you don't have good relationships with these people, they, they might just throw you out because uh, you're not behaving correctly in the setting. So there are a lot of taboos, a lot of, of, of norms that you can break, and you should that do that in a, in a very... Um, in a very careful way. Um, another, another example to make it more, more, more concrete how, what I think about it was um, I was consulting, I was coaching uh, a, a guy who, had, who was re responsible for a team and he told me over and over again that he thought that his team had competence issues. So he was very much convinced that they have competence problems. I was uh, able to participate in, in some of their team uh, meetings and realized that they don't have a competence issue at all. They have an empowerment problem, a huge empowerment problem, because the meeting settings were always the same. You had the guy himself, his senior people sitting very close to him, and then further and further and more and more in distance, the people with not that much knowledge, with not that much experience, with not that much years within the company. And there was one, um, there was one 
interim, um, she, she was yeah she was doing her internship at the company, and uh, she was only with the company for four months or something, and um, she she had tried to bring in new ideas about what what to do um, in these meetings two times, but got ignored, essentially, and. Um, I was thinking about what can I do? What is the small thing that I, c I can contribute to improve the situation? And what I came up with was I used my own spotlight that I had as an external consultant in that meeting to put a spotlight on her. So whenever I was asked, okay, Johannes, what do you think about the facts about what we should do next? I was uh, saying, okay, I think uh, from my conversation with, with Carrie, let's call her Carrie, that is situation. Um, I, I, know, I learned from her that she has some very good ideas about that. So what do you think, Carrie? What, what is your take on that, Carrie? And I, I really made that as kind of a habit in those meetings for several weeks. And it felt a little bit, it really put, pushed myself out of the comfort zone. It was really, uh, for the first two times, it was really difficult to do it. But then, uh, because all the people were obviously reacting uh, a little bit uh, weird to that, and or felt weird. So, uh, but then it 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 catched on in the in the team. So they really um, they realized that a Carrie had really good ideas, and and b there is something in letting people contribute to it. And finally, even the manager got it because uh, I'm not a smart guy here. The, the team knew that already, of course, right? That, that they had an empowerment problem and not an, a competence problem there. So this is one way how to. Um, intelligently misbehave. Good. Third aspect out of six, I want to talk about Nelson Mandela a little bit. Um, because he, uh, I think he's a very, very good example of how to build relationships as a re rebel. Uh, when, when Nelson Mandela was finally able to bring together black people, white people, people in power, poor people, and so on, in Clip Town, uh, 1955, to sign uh, the, 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 the Freedom Charter, that was quite an accomplishment. So what he really um, was able to do was bringing in together people, bringing people together and let them talk to each other for the first time. And he also, what is very interesting is that um, he also was talking and bringing people together, was talking to people um, that he do, did not even like most of, or some of them he even hated, of course, right? Because he were really, uh, he, they were part of his incarceration uh, earlier on, uh, um, you know, of the of the of the uh, suppression, of course, and um, that was quite an accomplishment for him to do that. So building building relationships is, I think, something we can learn from him. And later on, he he became the, the first uh, black president in 1994. That is. Uh, another huge accomplishment, of course. So how can we build coalitions of hope is the question here. Um, because hope in a company is a re really huge asset. Um, you, need to, um, you need to nurture it, and you can also use it as a tool to bring in hope into a company. Because a lot of situations are, at some time at, at least, hopeless, or seem to be hopeless. So how can you do that? Um, the hardest part of change is changing people. So we as change makers, we also always are in the relationship business. And uh, we need to nurture those relationships. Um, but you do not only need allies, not only friendly people, you also need opponents. You need people who are confronting yourself because that helps you to, to, con um, yeah, to, to, to crystallize the ideas that you have, to make it more sharp, to, to, really, to be, really be to the point and uh, achieve something with that. Mm. And the haters also can be your, your litmus test in that situation because uh, if, if nobody hates your idea, it's maybe just not radical enough. It's not shaking the boat enough. So that can also be a kind of help here. Um, um, a very pragmatic thing is or a practical thing is to create a good old stakeholder map. Uh, in this version here, you see um, we have all the forces that are opposing the change that you want to bring, and we have the, 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 so, uh, the forces that supports it. And um, you have your allies. These are the, the people that rally behind you. You have the neutral parties. You need to educate them. You need to help them to become allies, or at least not standing in the way. And then you have your opponents, and 
as I told you, you, you also need them uh, in the situation. And then you can ask yourself, um, what do those players want? What is, what's in it for them if we are in introducing this change? How can we make the change more, uh, less, less harmful, less hurtful for those people? Because then they are more inclined to go in the right direction. Another thing is that you can do is use the scarcity of attention. We know from psychologists that one of the scarcest thing in organization is actually attention. People don't get the, ex the attention that they want to have. We all want to have a certain amount of attention and a lot of people get ignored. And you, you can use that. You can put the spotlight uh, on those people. And um, one way to do this is to create a habit of always giving constructive feedback. Whenever you're working, whenever you have a, uh, a, a short conversation with somebody, give, give her a short feedback of what, what just happened or just an appreciation or affirmation of, yes, you are here, we had this conversation, and it was a, a brief moment, a micro moment of hope. That, that is something that you can definitely do. Okay. A third thing is, to amplify what's good, what is always, what is already good within the organization, because we can easily make the, the, the mistake, from my perspective, to think we need to change everything. From my experience, even if the situation is really miserable and everything shouts change, 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 we need to change uh, things here, um, there are always small pockets of, of good things. <laughs> You just have to find those positive defiance. Those people who are doing something completely different, but they're, they're contributing to the success and the, yeah, the, the, the forward movement within the company. Find those people and amplify what they're doing. This is sometimes the best thing that you can do, the best strategy as a consultant who wants to bring change. Find those people, alley up with those people, and help them to achieve what they, what they know best uh, to do. Okay, uh, here comes Iggy. Um, I think we can learn a lot about from Iggy. <laughs> and um, so what, what's, what's so special about Iggy in, in that perspective? Um, Iggy puts his skin into the game. Uh, since seven, se 70 years and still kicking, uh, he's doing that. So he's all passionate about music, uh, about also this lifestyle that he has, but it also has um, a, 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 it, part of the story is, of course, the, the struggles that he has or had with drugs and, 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 and the situation. But he was really willing to put himself into the situation. And I think this is also something that we can learn as consultants. We, are, we should be there for the long run. We should not just go in, um, prescript something uh, like, like a doctor, and then walk out again, get, get paid and, and never see you again or just see you again when you hand me over some more money. Uh, we need, we need to, to, to rethink how can we change that within the frameworks that we use, within the, the thinking, uh, how we approach those things. Okay, um, I will skip this, this example here, but um, it's about putting your, your, your skin into the game and here are some ideas how to do that. Um, taking risks. What, what risks I'm, I am willing to take here? Um, Peter Bragman, a leadership coach, uh, has a very good question for that. Um, he asks, am I willing to feel something here? I think that's a very profound question. It asks yourself, am I, how much am I able to be vulnerable in that situation? How much am I able to open up to other people and to show that sometimes I don't have the best answer? for example, right? And uh, how much be, am I able to be touched by the reactions of my, uh, the reactions that, that come out of my interventions that I do as a, as a designer, as a coach here? Sharing the pain is also a part of it. Uh, so, so often we bring change to a, to a unit, to a department, to a team, to a person, and we think, it's part of our professionalism to stay above going there and actually see what happens when we change things. So investigating and being able to, to go there and sit with those people, sharing the pain and seeing how can I, 
can I uh, reduce the pain that they're feeling right now? I guess it's also something that, that, that we should do. And if we're not doing that, if you want to look at it from, a, from, a, from an economical perspective, uh, people will know it. They, they will realize it. They will, will just find it out. They will, will feel it intuitively that this person is not here to risk his skin. Stretching beyond, beyond your limits is also something. So asking yourself, how much, much am I able here to really move out of my comfort zone? Can I go even a further step and an yet another step to really put myself on the spot um, and, uh, and, and be part of it instead just being a bystander uh, of the change? Okay. Um, Marina, fifth aspect. Um, Marina Abramovic, um, not all of you might know her, but uh, she's, she's very uh, well known for her work that she did, for example, at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in 2010 was her exhibition, uh, The Artist is Present, that is something from there, where she just sat for three months and people could come, they, they lined up uh, a huge queue and people could just sit with Marina for some minutes and be there with the with the artist, with her, and um, yeah, it was kind of putting full attention to this one person, right, in this in this environment, and that was what she do, did to these people. And some of them cried, some of them laughed, some of them were just baffled by what, by what was happening. But it definitely changed people. Uh, it changed people in a positive way because it was a demonstration of what attention can do to people, positive attention, what, how much it can help people to think about their own relationship to their mind, to their body, and to, to others. So it was a questioned identity in a way. That is, I think th that is very interesting. And um, that's why I picked her for talking about act to activate. Normally when you think about acting or activating, uh, it's of course very dynamic, but I like the fact that Marina is activating people with, or was activating people there with just sitting and just paying attention to people. Uh, I think that's that's interesting. So um, to make the change happen, we need to take actions, of course. And a lot of times we are there's a lot of talk, but not so much action. So the question is how how can we act to activate? Uh, Two ideas here. Um, first is making progress tangible. For example, um, you can create something like a minimal viable chance. Change. <laughs> change, sorry. Um, so using the chance to, to create this kind of change. Um, meaning, how can I prototype that? The, the change that I want to have here, what is the, the smallest version of it? What is the first step to go in the right direction? For example, if you cannot, for any reasons, still introduce Agile in your company, for whatever reasons, just suggest that you do a daily stand-up. So just suggest it and, and, and see if people try it out and what is the experience if we have this daily stand-up as part of becoming more Agile, right? Or if you think, the, the meeting culture is horrible here. We are, not, we are not achieving anything. Just introduce this idea of having two minutes in the end of, the, of every meeting where you write down the decisions. What actual decisions did we make in this meeting? And uh, from my experience, this can, this can already change a lot uh, in the dynamics of, uh, of, of people. And then also, it's one thing to have this minimal viable change. The other thing is put it in the spotlight really show it to people, make it tangible that people see, okay, this is something that we achieved. Maybe in an all-hands meeting or something where you have regular presentations within the company, use that to show people the results of the change. Don't talk about the process first. I tried that, it, it failed miserably. People are not interested in the process. We, of course, need to be highly interested in process. People are not interested. They are interested in outcomes, in tangible stuff. Show it to them first, and then when they ask you, how did you achieve that? How is that even possible? You can then say, okay, look, this is the small process that we used and then it, it goes forward, so it's, it's rolling on, okay? The other idea is um, that action breeds confidence and courage. And um, 
we, we had a conversation just, just uh, at lunch around that topic, I guess, where we say um, there's a, a, a virtual circle when we change what we do, so we change our behaviors, it changes what we think, feel, and believe. And at the same time, when we change our thinking, and um, also it also changes what we do. So it feeds into each other, and it's very important to make that, that circle a virtuous circle and not a vicious circle. So better introduce good ideas, introduce good behaviors that change uh, the, the situation. And then it can be um, an ongoing thing. And to have that in a company, I think a concept like psychological safety is very, very important. So how can we create a space where people can really do that, where people are free and, um, and also open enough, vulnerable enough to, uh, to behave in, in different ways and to, to change their, their, their thinking and their mindsets. Okay, here's the last one, and for me it's the most important one. Uh, Marie Curie. Um, so what is, she, she's, she's completely exciting, uh, and, and I, I could talk for hours about her, but um, what I love about her is, um, so just some facts to, to remind you, she was the first woman uh, getting the Nobel Prize, she was the first and only woman getting two Nobel Prizes for physics and for chemistry. Um, she was really, um, she was, um, she was all the time very, very humble in what she did. Uh, she came from a very humble uh, background, uh, emigrated from, from Poland to, to come to Paris to, to study there, and, uh, and then her career developed. Later on, she was the first woman teaching at Sorbonne, and she is one of the, of course, obviously one of the, the, the very early pioneers for feminism and for, for, uh, for women into science. Um, so that is also very important. Um, and all the time, she stayed very humble, uh, and that is what I what I like about her the most, and uh, why I think she's a very good example for daring to be humble, that we can also learn. Um, going back to the story, with which I began uh, our conversation here, or my talk here, uh, about this innovation program that I was leading in the company, um, it was became a failure because my ambitions were misguided. I, I, was, I was not humble enough in that situation. I should have said, okay, I need to know much more about the circumstances, about the history and about the people. And I, to, I not only have to check my lists of innovation or how to build an innovative uh, cu culture and something like that, but really listen <laughs> and really open up and ask myself, okay, what I'm not asking and, and, and things like that. So being much more humble. Uh, later on, I'm very, very um, uh, happy about the outcomes because, because I learned a lot in that situations. Um, small steps of transformation that are still with me and all the, and some of the people that I worked with. But um, I think it's it's a very uh, important stance that you take to be more humble. Good. How to do that? Two short ideas, small ideas. I think we need to teach our tongue to say I don't know. <laughs> that is very, very important. I just don't know. And that also means um, embracing unpredictability, embracing, uh, embracing the uncertainty that, that our complex world brings with us, and just saying, okay, uh, let us find it out together. Um, that, I think that sets us free, because it also frees ourselves from this immense burden of always being in the know always having the right answers. It's more like we are finding the answers together. We are in this together and I will be there to help us all, to, to support us, to facilitate this conversation on how to, um, how to make sense uh, out of this chaos, how to create small pockets of order within all this complexity. Mm. And the other aspect is and this is the inner core. This is going back to this inner circle of how you change as a change maker. It's about thinking about how does that change me? How taking in the time for reflection and introspection um, to ask yourself, okay, uh, what, what do I know now about myself that I didn't know before this change program, this change initiative, the work that I've done, and, and constantly asking yourself about that. 
And uh, I think that also helps us to be much more aligned with ourselves, but also with the situation that we are in. Okay, I know that was a lot of stuff. Uh, thanks for staying with me. Uh, we've come, came full circle. Uh, we, we saw with, with Gandhi what is really there. Uh, we were questioning the status quo with Elon Musk, building coalitions with Mandela. Uh, then Iggy showed us how to put the skin in the game, uh, acting to activate uh, with Marina. And Marie Curie uh, told us something about how to dare to be humble. Okay, if you want to learn more, talk more about it and be inspired, I'm, I'm planning to create a, a small website for it. So just go there and, uh, and, and, and leave your email address. I will inform you when it's ready. Uh, it will take a while, but I'm, I'm on it. Um, and now I uh, hope that we have at least one, one question or two questions time for that. That would be great. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>